Good afternoon and welcome to the last session of this workshop, QEEE workshop on effective use of ICT in uh, teaching and learning in engineering. What we will do in this session, we will uh, do it in two or three parts. We will first do an overall summary of what happened in the last six to seven weeks, which included the three, uh, three days where you assembled in the synchronous classrooms, then the long online phase and these three last days. So, we will do an overall summary in terms of content, in terms of the assignments you did, in terms of uh, what resources you all created which now can be used by the community and so on. Okay, so, let us start with the summary. So, this slide is really a snapshot, it is okay if you cannot exactly read it, it is a long, it is a wide snapshot zoomed out view of what all happened, what you did and what we did in the last 6 to 7 weeks. This is day 1, day 2 and day 3, here is your online phase and here are the last 3 days, the third column. If you look a little closely, you can see that we had sessions, we had labs, we had assignments. In terms of content, there is technology, there is instructional strategies, there are assessment strategies. In terms of you creating resources, you created instructional materials such as uh, uh, you created assessment questions, you created peer instruction homework and so on. So, this is really the entire view, entire uh, outline of what all happened. And there was also one big lesson plan and one survey which came out of uh, this workshop. So, now if we want to summarize how we approach the content. So, if somebody asks us what was the content about, what did you learn in the workshop, what were the different topics. One way to look at this is that our approach to the content of workshop actually is the integration of learning objectives, teaching learning or instructional strategies and assessment strategies. So, this triangle is something you have been familiar with now for uh, several days. So, all these three together in a balanced fashion when they are integrated make up teaching and learning. And on top of this in this workshop, we added a layer of technology which formed the role as a support base for all these different aspects. So, this is our picture as to what happened in the content of the workshop. There were three main independent topics which got linked and throughout there was technology uh, being used in the strategies and the assessment and so on. However, the answer to what happened in the workshop does not stop there, because by now I am sure you are all familiar and even as teachers, experienced teachers you are familiar that it is not just the content which forms the basis of teaching and learning. There was this this dimension of the, uh, the format of the workshop. How did you learn? How did we teach? What kind of interaction happened? So, from that angle, our approach to the format of the workshop was primarily active learning and collaboration based. And there is, if you recall what all happened in the last 6 weeks, you will see that during the SRC sessions, there were polls, debates, think pair share activities. In every session, there was chat through AVU where you asked questions, we responded, you commented, you responded to our questions, we synthesized your answers. So, during the during each and every SRC session, there was a mix of all of these uh, interaction modes. And there was a lot of active learning you were doing during each of these sessions. It was not that we were transmitting and you were listening. There were several SRC activities which started with find a partner and do something. So, the collaboration was not just between us and you, but also between each other within your own uh, centers. Many activities in the lab as well as in the uh, classroom during the synchronous phases was when you did something or created something uh, with partners. You created course materials also with partners and in the online phase, there were opportunities for interaction through muddy points and chats 
And finally, I put peer review in the format because that is also one of the teaching learning strategies which is uh, really important as an active strategy where people learn from. So, our approach to content to summarize was integration of objectives, strategies and assessment and our uh, approach to format was active learning, collaboration and interactions. So, having said this given a very top level broad view, let us go a little bit more into the detail both in the content and the format. Okay, so, let us look at the content, the learning objectives session. So, if you remember all I would say every session had a slide which said the learning objectives of this session are. So, learning objectives was not only a standalone session, but it was an integral part of each and every session because that forms the basis of teaching and learning. The goals and the aims and what we want our students or our learners in this case our learners are the participants all of you. Uh, there were three specific independent sessions devoted to learning objectives. So, here are those sessions where we said we talked about the what and why of learning objectives the very first session on day one. Then we looked at a hierarchy of objectives because not all objectives are at the same cognitive level. Some are at lower levels like remember and understand, some are at higher levels like evaluate and create and we went through all the different uh, hierarchies, uh, we went through all the levels in the hierarchy. And then we integrated, we brought in technology and looked at the digital, digital version of Bloom's taxonomy where different tools and different ways of using the tool were mapped to the different cognitive levels. And then there was one specific assignment to where you created learning objectives for your own course. So, needless to say learning objectives is really important and what you will do from now I mean what you need to do in your courses is to think about this not only for every course once at the beginning, but also when you go into the classes or when you are preparing the classes. Uh, one more aspect of the workshop the most important aspect really are the participants all of you. So, throughout the summary we will also be tracking, we will also be uh, summarizing how many people were there in the beginning, how many did the assignments and so on. So, we began with a total of about 1100 registrations and the first assignment on day 1 on learning objectives 781 of you submitted assignments on Moodle. So, we have records of these and these are going to be useful not only for your courses but also for others when they teach similar courses. Okay. So, one quick question when we are thinking about uh, learning objectives, I will go back to the earlier slide, but can you identify one common characteristic between the three sessions on learning objectives apart from the fact that they are all about the same content that is objectives, what else was common? Look at this slide and just shout out the answer in your RC. So, you have to fill, up, fill in the blanks in a sentence saying all sessions on learning objectives blank only from this slide. Okay, so, I will just let you discuss with each other, but the point we want to make here is that all the sessions on learning objectives really were the first sessions either of that entire phase or the first session of the day. So, the very first day the very first session was on learning objectives and then when you came back from your online phase the very first day, day 4 the first session was again on learning objectives. And the point we are trying to make here again is that since learning objectives form the backbone of all teaching and learning start with that. So, here is a schedule table and organization table that we will keep showing throughout the summary these were when the learning objective sessions happened. Let us move on to the next large part of the content which were the strategies, the instructional strategies, teaching learning strategies, technology based strategies, face to face strategies and so on. When you recall what strategies were discussed during the workshop. We saw this morning that we can classify the strategies as those related to technology of education, where we are thinking of the science of education and the practice of implementing education. 
and strategies such as peer instruction and think pair share and debate were all part of this. There was there were also many strategies focusing on the technology tools for education, visualizations, wikis, Moodle, screencast for some, we will go into detail to in each of them in, in a few minutes. And it was not just each of these independently, we also did several sessions and several assignments where you had to integrate one technology with an instructional strategy, for example, the flipped class. There was an integration of the flipped class spoken tutorials or screencasts with in class um, active learning strategies. Again, it is not just the what, it is not just the content, it is also the how. So, how did you learn these strategies or how did we discuss the strategies together? First, you got exposed to the use of it as the learner. So, you we asked you a peer instruction question and you answered. We asked you to participate in a think pair share activity giving you 5 minutes for one phase and 2 minutes for another phase and you responded over chat. After that in the assignments, we asked you to implement the strategy for your own course as a teacher. So, if you see you first experience the strategy as a learner and then you create activities using that strategy as a teacher. So, this cycle is quite uh, strong in the sense it is not that directly we ask you to do some high level creation. At the same time we, we do not stop at simply getting exposure. And needless to say all these happened in active learning mode because throughout the workshop all these strategies were used. Okay, so, brief review on the technology of education. So, there were three specific active learning strategies, maybe a few more, but three which we discussed in great detail the peer instruction, think pair share and group project. So, what, what we mean here by explicit discussion and, and application means that there were independent sessions for each of them, there were more than one assignments, there were in class activities and so on. And then some other strategies where you use them mostly as a learner debate, brainstorm race, fastest finger and so on. We also use these strategies without discussing, discussing it very explicitly and that is why I want to talk about it a little bit here. For many assignments that you submitted both in the online phase and also in the first couple of days of the synchronous phase there were self assessment questions and criteria which were part of the assignment or they were given to you the next day. And from education literature, education research self assessment is one of the very powerful and very uh, effective ways of getting learners to learn. So, again this is something you can try for certain assignments in your own class that prepare a short set of criteria or rubrics and you can ask students to score themselves on it or you can ask them to do a peer assessment. Again here you did a peer review for one of the assignments. One more strategy which we used, but did not talk much about except this morning was most or in all sessions there were about there was about 10 minutes of slides where we were telling something followed by an activity followed by some another few slides on a new idea. In fact, every session almost every session started off with an activity and I think the only exception to this is this particular session where we do not have activities the way we had it. Remember the blue slides where participants were asked to do something and coordinators had to tell us by chat those are what we mean by the activities. So, in your in one of the sessions I believe on day 2 or day, day 3 I believe there were several scenarios posed about 6 different scenarios and the moral of those scenarios was that break up your lecture into pieces into chunks, do not go more than 20 minutes ideally do 15 minutes then some activity another 15 minutes and so on. Underlying everything all of these is an alignment between objective strategy and assignment the same triangle that you keep on seeing. Coming to numbers 233 assignments for peer instruction, 300 plus for think pair share and 53 on group projects because this just happened yesterday. And let me remind you right now uh, the assignments will be open till August 2nd, so you still have room to submit. There were specific ET tools 
which had their own sessions and where you created assignments, visualizations, concept maps, screencasting for, for, for flip classroom. These are also called video casts and sometimes you will hear us uh, call it as spoken tutorials, wikis, Moodle and open educational resources which you use to find visualizations, repositories where there were several visualizations on the same topic which were uploaded. You use these in the synchronous sessions and also in the online sessions and then there were other technology tools which you got exposure to. This, these are just a few of them. If you remember the digital taxonomy session, there were several of them on that day. Again here are the number of assignments that were submitted. So we can see that between 200 and 300 assignments on an average are being submitted per uh, assignment. All right. Here is the organization, the oranges are the objectives and the purples are the strategies. Assessment, this was the third pillar of that triangle, third vertex. There was one whole session on assignment, uh, uh, explicitly on this should be called assessment, there is a typo here sorry, a uh, whole session on ass assessment using revised Bloom's taxonomy and you experienced both formative and summative assessment. Again this may be a word that we have only briefly used. Formative assessment is what we do mostly in class where the goal is for you to learn. We pose a question, the learners answer and they get feedback immediately and they improve their learning. So formative assessment you can think of as a feedback loop and summative assessment is what is done for grading and so on. Again in assessment sometimes you had the role as a teacher where you were learning about how to create assessment questions for higher order thinking skills. This is a, jar, a piece of jargon, this, this term you can use if you look at educational research, ET research, you will see this term quite often these days. So if you are interested in doing what we discussed in the morning, try to look up some papers on HOTS. So when we discussed rubrics or HOTS, your role was that, as a, was that of a teacher and sometimes you had the role of a learner where you did the assignments and we gave you assessment checklists. Finally, participant as a researcher mode, this is also assessment or evaluation of our own strategies. So that is why the research methods uh, session this morning comes on this slide. Okay. <coughs> so just as an interrupt, now that you have had a good idea of what all we have done and you have been, your memory has been refreshed about all the sessions, what we will be doing immediately after the summary is a Q&A session with all of you with doing either floor transfer or taking the questions over chat. So what you can do is now that you have seen all the uh, summary of various activities that have happened in the workshop, if you have any queries, you know, some of you have not yet no, not posted on Moodle. So you could start posting your queries on chat and as the summary ends, we will start answering the queries over chat and then do the floor transfer for you to actually ask the questions also. Okay, so here is the final slide of the organization which shows all the individual sessions. So again these are the pieces of content that we discussed that you looked at. What you should do when you go back and before this workshop evaporates from your memory is to just revisit the slides and the assignments that you did from all these three days and use the summary to guide your revisit. Our story or our whole approach in the workshop did not really stop at saying that here we did objectives and here we did strategies and so on because we have been stressing this alignment, this three way alignment and the alignment with technology throughout. So what you should focus on when you go back and look at the slides is where all this alignment happened and when you do your own teaching and when you th think of strategies for your own practice, use this alignment. So the alignments we had, let me just come to the main point here. There was a three way alignment between the learning objectives, instructional strategies and the assessment strategy and we are calling this as, this has a term, uh, we will put the reference in when we upload the slides and it is called uh, constructive alignment. It is, there are several research studies again which says that when there is constructive alignment in the teaching pra and learning practice, the effectiveness of the learning is much more and when one of these links gets broken, uh, it lowers the effectiveness. Okay. Matching assessment to objectives, I think this is something we have done a lot. So you can just take a look at it. Let me show you a few instances where 
alignment explicitly happened. So, if you remember concept maps sometime on day 2 I believe, we used we discussed concept maps as a strategy for course design. So, there is an element of instructional strategy where we said how do you use lower and higher order learning objectives to create your entire course. One of my colleagues in fact worked out a concept map for her own analog electronics course here. And then you went to the lab and used a technology tool to create a concept map for your own course. So, this is the kind of use of technology that you can also do in your own teaching. 630 assignments were submitted for this uh, homework. Okay, one more explicit use because the, again there was a lot of assignments and uh, submissions here. We discussed about how to find visualizations using repositories, but we also discussed a lot and you did two homeworks in fact on how to use visualizations where the idea was you do not simply make your students watch it, but you do active learning strategies where the teacher does something this is one example pauses there is a big pause here then the students do something the teacher does asks a question students answer teacher shows the result and so on. So, instead of demonstrating visualizations use one of the several active learning strategies that you have used that you have learned to use with the visualization. And here there were I think uh, three one or two or three homeworks uh, uh, two homeworks I think homework assignments and there were nine, 960 submissions many of them have good strategies in them. I think because you are all mostly science and engineering teachers visualizations is one technology that you can readily use in your own classrooms. Flipped classroom is another explicit example where we can where we integrate the technology in the screencast out of class where uh, people where the students learn the content the information through the screencast and then in class there are active learning strategies to apply and assimilate. So, again there are strategies and technologies integration again several of you did the assignments here. There was a survey with flipped classroom I think we had asked you how many how many of you would implement it. So, we will go and take a look for all these strategies if you do any uh, if you use them in your class if you want to share it with us. So, we have created a Moodle forum and uh, we will keep monitoring it uh, do share it so that uh, the so that we, uh, we know what is happening and we can share it with the other participants also. There is a chat question uh, can we get guidance on learning strategies from QEEE team even after the end of the workshop definitely yes and here are possible ways one is that the Moodle forum will be active for some time. Uh, the second is that on our website educational technology we have started uploading some resources. So, we will give you the link to it at the end and you can go there and download the resources. Oh yes there is a collaborative wiki which I think uh, 150 of you have already started or maybe 100 have already started collaborating on. So, there are you can use the wiki there is a last slide we have on this uh, summary which will uh, which has all of those together. So, you can use the collaborative wiki you can post on Moodle and we have given you one of our contact email addresses also ok collaboration with wiki since we just talked about it you know exactly what it is, but again here think of wikis not just as a technology tool, but also as a means a strategy to uh, get your students to collaborate. So, some of these tools are for the teacher primarily for the teacher, but do think of using many of these tools with your students wikis and group projects for example, are very useful. Uh, another way last example of integration if you remember digital Bloom's taxonomy we had the revised Bloom's taxonomy and then we integrated with, with the technology tools. So, again there you have a lot of ideas where your students who are the digital classroom learners can use the technologies. And the two biggest examples of integration of alignment were the lesson plan you created where you had everything from objectives to the strategy to the technology tools to assessment and also in the group project. So, we since these were done in the last 2 3 days I am expecting that more will come in and we will start going through these and we will uh, post the good ones and uh, we will do find a way to share this with the community. 
Okay, constructive alignment started during the online phase and a lot of it happened yesterday. One thing which has been constant throughout again is the interaction and collaborative nature of this workshop. So, in collaboration and interaction are important for the 21st century learner, hence as teachers we, they are really important for us too. So, how did it happen in this workshop and what can you do with it? So, during these synchronous sessions through AVU, there were several peer instruction questions and polls and we just did a quick count and there were about 45 little more than between 45 and 50 over the 6 SRC days. There were 14 think pair share activities, chat was open throughout right from the minute we opened the session till we closed it and as your chat questions are coming now, my colleague here is noting down your questions and right after that we will answer them. So, we are using chat really on a real time basis to help to answer your questions and we did some flow transfer. Online phases also had Moodle discussions and office hours. So, we from this one I think one thing you can take away as teachers is one is for your own classes where you can use these polls and think pair shares, but also if you are running workshops of any kind faculty development programs. I think some of you are in charge of faculty development programs in your own colleges. So, think about using mechanisms like this even if you do not have a view in fact, in face to face such interactions are much easier but structure them as polls and think pair share activities and chats and so on. There were interaction and collaboration between you and your fellow participants again I think this is something we mentioned at the beginning of the session that all active learning activities were done with a partner labs and peer review. On Moodle there is one explicit forum called strengthening QEEE community. So far there are 21 different threads on it plus replies and totally on Moodle we have about 80 threads and close to 200 posts. Moodle is not only for logistics you can use it to ask us well this is broken or I cannot get into my assignment, but think of Moodle as asking content based questions. So, use Moodle to say uh, this is what I tried in class and this worked well and this did not work, work well has anybody else tried it. So, you can use this forum to do all of such questions and answers. Finally, what happened today morning we touched upon how to go from ET practitioners or people who are using an ET in their uh, classes towards becoming ET researchers. So, there was a whole morning session on this we showed a lot of resources towards the end as to how you can become or go towards becoming ET researchers come to the conference on technology for education this December it is in Amrita University from December 18th. And what next? So, as an ET practitioner you need to complete this assignments in one week as a workshop participant down here you have to fill out the surveys which will be uploaded in Moodle over the next few days. So, this is for you the last one here is for you as a participant the first one is for you, you as a teacher and as a participant. As an ET researcher we have a forum on Moodle called mission 2015 we discussed that this morning go to Moodle and start posting there. And there is a wiki where all the resources that you have created the lesson plans and the questions can be combined and uh, made into a resource which all of us can use together. So, if you have any questions again Moodle is one good way which will be open for some more time and you can use this email address res in et workshop dot iitb at gmail. So, Jay Krishnan or somebody else will respond to it. Yeah. Okay, so, now we will move on to answering some of the queries that you have raised on chat. So, the first query was on we need more guidance after the workshop and like what we have just seen on the what next slide there are going to be there you can contact res in, res in et workshop at gmail dot com as well as we will be keeping the mission 2015 community and the et repository wiki alive. Uh, the other question <coughs> was on which strategies do you use at IIT B and which have you found to be most useful. So, we actually use all of these strategies at IIT Bombay that is why we are sharing these strategies because we have 
tried them ourselves and we find that they are effective. That is why we are going ahead with sharing these strategies. So which have you found to be most useful actually depends upon the purpose of your instruction. So if it is, for example, a classroom scenario where you want to check whether the students have understood what you taught them in the previous class, then a peer instruction question is a good strategy to use. If it is a scenario where you want students to debate about pros and cons of two strategies, then a debate is a good uh, mechanism. If you want students to come up with multiple designs for a solution, then a think pair share is a good mechanism. If you want students to work offline at home and then collaborate, then a collaborative wiki or a web quest, one of those are a good mechanism. So in our courses, we use all the in-class strategies and some of the offline strategies. See, the thing that we want to uh, emphasize here is that if you are going to switch from lecturing to use of education technology strategies, you need to make that switch gradually so that your students also can move along with you. If you suddenly jump from pure lecturing to using lots of strategies the next day itself, it is not only going to be daunting for you, it's also going to be daunting for all your students. So our suggestion would be that choose the strategies which appeal to you the most. Right now you have got exposure to all the strategies. You have also having a create level expertise of some of the strategies. So choose the ones which are appealing to you most. Try a few at a time. And in the course of time, you will gain expertise on all these strategies. Okay, so <clears throat> then the next question was on uh, more on wikis. So there was some question about more on wikis. So I will uh, let Jay Krishnan answer that. So uh, as participants, uh, you will be given instructions on how to use uh, the ET repository wiki uh, in the coming two days. That means at most by Monday afternoon, we'll post you specific instructions on how wikis are going to be used. If it is about other examples of wiki. So in your online uh, wiki assignment, at the end of the slide, we have given you some uh, links to different wikis and websites which talk more about how to use wikis effectively. So uh, within the ETA repository wiki itself, we'll be populating these links and you'll, you can uh, view those wikis and see how they have actually used wikis uh, within their classroom. Yeah, and okay. at some point of time, you can join those wikis and see what all additional functionalities you are able to do within that wiki. OK. <coughs> so uh, moving on, another question was there on uh, examples of best assignments and access to assignments of other participants. So this, again, is going to happen along with the wiki itself. And uh, what we will be doing is, as part of the peer review, you will be rating the assignments and the best assignments will automatically get higher ratings and they will be accessible for everybody. So in the wiki, as Jay Krishnan just men mentioned, you will be able to find that uh, many of them are, uh, uh, the assignments are available, access to assignment for other participants. Okay, so there's again one question on how to do active learning in a 55 minute class. So this is uh, something that we have repeatedly addressed, but it is still worth addressing one more time. So the idea is that your entire 55 minute class need not be full of active learning. So you can simply emulate what we have done in this course in every session. So we start with saying, OK, here is a scenario. We do some small active learning. And then we do some telling for 15 minutes. Then we do another part of active learning. Once again, there is a summary. So this is the mechanism that you can adopt. So just go back to the idea of chunking, as was mentioned, that you chunk your lecture into maybe 15 minute chunks and intersperse them with active learning techniques for ensuring that your students have at least apply level uh, competency with the content that you are uh, talking about. So ideally, if you have one PI uh, two or three PI questions and a think pair share in a 55 minute face to face classroom, that will be sufficient to ensure that your classroom is engaged 
80% of the time. Okay, so there was another question about uh, the similarities and differences between revised Bloom's taxonomy and digital taxonomy. This is there in the uh, resource PPT of the digital Bloom uh, day, four uh, day 4 AM1 slides, which has been uploaded. Okay, then there is one question on you know article on English language teaching for uh, research methods. Now we are not exactly familiar with this um, finding a resource on English language teaching, but we have given you the links to the databases and so on. So what you should do is carry out today's worksheet activity thoroughly and you will be able to find resources for English language teaching. Uh, there are a couple of administrative questions. One on RC number is required for the assignment submission, which if you don't know, it's fine. You can just uh, post on Moodle. Post your assignment on Moodle or you post the query on Moodle. Uh, how long will the Moodle account be active? At least till August 15th. Two months. And uh, two months after the workshop? And okay. it's usually active for two months after the workshop. And uh, if required, we will see depending upon the amount of activity. If there is a lot of activity on Moodle, if there is chat and all that going on, and if there are queries being posted, then we will even keep it active for more time beyond that. Okay, so that brings us to the end of questions that uh, people have asked over chat. So what we can do now is a few flow transfers. So in case you have a question which uh, you can do a hand raise. In case you have a question that you did not type out on uh, chat, you can do a hand raise and we'll transfer the floor. Please go ahead. Um, uh, Madam, uh, uh, my name is uh, uh, Srinivas from Sri Vijayaniketan Engineering College, Tirupati from Andhra Pradesh. Uh, we are planning to uh, conducting revised digital broom taxonomy questions, uh, whatever the subjects we are teaching. Uh, those revised digital broom taxonomy. Uh, uh, is it suitable uh, for second year students while implementing the questions? That is my question, madam. Okay. Second year BTEC students. Okay. So let me, since there have been a few questions on this, let me just speak a few minutes about what this digital Bloom's taxonomy is. So the basis of all the assessment questions and all the learning objectives are the revised Bloom's taxonomy that we discussed on uh, in the first day and in the beginning, which, which means, which says that in fact if you look at learning objectives and assessment questions, they are not all at the same cognitive level and what we mean by so same cognitive level, very loosely speaking you can think of it as the same amount of mental effort that the student has to put in, in order to solve that question, in order to address that question. So there are six levels from remembering information to trying to understand it by giving an example, by applying it, uh, by solving a problem, all the way till the student creates something, let's say designs a circuit to solve a problem. So the six levels from remember, understand, etc., all the way up to create is really the basis of all the taxonomies. When you are forming question papers, when you are thinking about what assessment to do, go with that hierarchy. Now, what the digital taxonomy does over and above that is suppose you want to give students an opportunity to use technology tools as part of their own assignment. So let us say you want students to use wikis in the group project or you want students to use Google Docs to create a survey form. Then the digital taxonomy tells you how to use which tool for which goal. Hearing your question, I think it, w w what seems more suitable is to set the question paper for second year BTEC or BE courses. Think in terms of the original Bloom's taxonomy from uh, recall till uh, create and make sure that you have a mix of higher order questions as well as lower on order questions. Okay, let us go to the next uh, question. Vasvi College, Hyderabad. Uh, good afternoon, madam. We are from Vasva Engineering College. I am Dr. Saib, sir. In the digital Bloom's taxonomy, several tools are explained for use by the students. Mm -hmm. But in case of uh, day scholar students and first and second year level of engineering students, 
uh, will they get diverted from learning the subject contents because of the practicing various tools and uh, exposed to these uh, uh, technologies through internet normally today uh, engineering students uh, most of the all the students are uh, facing three threats from internet mobile phone and uh, facebook in addition to that if you allow uh, so many technologies exposure to them uh, how far they concentrate on the subject that is my question okay so this is again a classic question and often we have this question as parents when our children are getting exposed to more technologies than we are familiar with and uh, see the answer here is that the use of technology is not something that you can first of all prevent so the your children and your students are anyway going to get exposed to this technology and simply saying that okay the technology is going to be a distraction is not a reason for not using the technology so what we have to do is we have to use the technology to our advantage we have to set the questions in such a way that the power of the technology is exploited for the learning otherwise what can happen is like suppose we were to say that look we are not going to use any technology what might happen is that uh, people may just simply stop coming to class because they can always find whatever you are telling them elsewhere so they can find it in text form they can find it in video form so there really is no motivation for them to come to class so the point here is that we don't want to go overboard with using technology for technology's sake that is the thing that we have to be guarding against what we have to do is to make sure that we are using the technology for the correct purpose for example even if you take the sessions that we have conducted if you look at the technology of a view poll that we did we have not gone ahead and simply used the technology because the technology existed the polls were actually useful and it was useful for you to see those responses and so on right so that is basically the idea so you have to take a call on the purpose and the main thing as teachers that we have to keep in mind is that we cannot react from our own uh, fear or dislike of use of technology because our students are definitely going to be comfortable and exposed to that so we have to overcome our initial thing get exposed to the technology as first as users and then try to see how we can utilize the technology for uh, improving the teaching learning experience of our students uh, just to add to that there is one more point here that it's if you are trying to set an assignment or get your students to do some task that was discussed in the digital taxonomy session don't start by thinking which tech don't come from the technology perspective to begin with because finally the goal is some sort of teaching and learning start from the teaching and learning goals and then you can see which technology is more suitable and which ones our students have and so on so when you shift your own focus from saying oh how many technology tools should i include is it too much is it too little and all shift it from there to saying here are the goals and technology actually does help us as well as our students once we get over this apprehension that uh, you just heard about phd college of technology coimbatore uh, in the bloom's taxonomy level uh -huh. cognitive level right uh, in which level the optimization comes to fit in uh optimization questions if if the students are actually doing optimize level tasks it would be analyze or evaluate level so when you have a task where you give a problem and ask students to optimize it based on certain parameters it will come at the higher levels however if you only ask understand level questions like what are the different parameters of optimization then it will get lower so it really depends on how which question you ask but it can get up to analyze and evaluate Sri Vidya Niketan Engineering College. Uh, uh, madam, one more question, Madam, regarding uh, today's session. Um, in, a, uh, in order to improve the technology-enhanced learning metrics, what are the practical things we have to implement in the class, Madam? Okay, so the uh, the point here is not to improve the technology enhanced learning metric so the first not thing you have to implement. start with yeah it's it's not a question of implementing that metric the thing that you have to start with is to identify a problem that you want to solve in your class okay so the metric is only for you to help and think about 
how to go about doing the research study based on your solution. So uh, what we have is, let's say there is a problem that is happening in the class, like you find that students are not engaged. Okay, So for that problem, you come up with a solution. Let's say maybe your solution is that you will tell a joke after every 10 minutes. Okay, So now, the metrics come only after your problem and solution have been identified. So what you want to do is you want to find out that, okay, does my solution really solve the problem? So, for example, if you take a solution like, okay, I will tell a joke every 10 minutes, you certainly don't want to be measuring learning effectiveness because the joke is not directly contributing anything to the learning effectiveness. So what you want to be measuring is attractiveness to see that whether students are engaged in my classroom or not. So the metrics come into play after you have identified what is the teaching learning problem that you want to solve in your class, followed by what is your solution idea. And the metrics will help you to evaluate how well does your solution solve the problem. OK, so uh, there are no further hand raises. So what we will do is we will uh, randomly go to a few centers. And you can share one idea out of this workshop that you are sure that you are going to implement in your class. Okay. So there are no questions as of now. So what we will do is for the next 15 minutes, we will not transfer floor simply for you to ask a question and for us to try to respond. Instead, you can say what your opinion is. Ideally, what we would like is that you say one thing from this workshop that you are sure you are going to implement in your upcoming course. Okay, so we will transfer to G.H. Raisoni College. Thank you for conducting such a good session. Uh, the question is that uh, we will be planning for animation in the class. So in animation, we will be uh, uh, like we will go for strategy like predict uh, the outcome of it. So we will be pausing it, then it will be think and pressure. That was a good uh, activity which uh, we have never conducted. So that's something you, which course will you try it in? Uh, I tried for computer architecture and organization to okay. third sem uh, B student. Okay, so after you try it, if whatever your responses were, you can share it to us over Moodle. Let us know what happened in your class. Uh, it was for uh, uh, algorithm and uh, many students were uh, able to solve it. Some were not uh, able to solve it, but uh, after getting exact answer and then uh, telling them with the help of the animation, they were easily, uh, made them easily understand it. Okay, thanks. Let's next. Ah, so I see Professor Fatak there. I think I'll transfer floor to him only after another 15 minutes. Uh, thank you for being there. I also see Professor Sahasrabuddha, I think, barely in the uh, in the view. OK. Uh, yeah, so is there a participant who wants to share something? Hello. I am Bhagyashri Athavale from College of Engineering, Pune. I want to share you that I will use in pair share and Edit the outcome activities in my class because I am teaching mathematics, so I feel that those are very suitable activities. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So when you tell us which strategy you will use, also tell us a little bit about which course you plan to use it in. PSG College? Um, give us some suggestion to evaluate the dominant player and the slow member in a group project. No? Okay. So if you remember the session from two days ago on group projects, what we, so th this is actually a question that has come up that how do you, how does one evaluate different team members in a project, especially if there's a wide difference between them. Let's say you have somebody who's more dominant and who's more active and somebody else who's holding himself or herself behind. What do you do and how do you evaluate it? This is where the idea of individual as well as group assessment comes in. And you can use a different set of rubrics for group work and a set of rubrics for individual work of each participant. So if you spell out the criteria that each individual participant should be responsible for and put in a few criteria and evaluate them not just at the end but at least once in the middle of the project. Give them back the feedback. That might help you a little bit. RVIT Bijnor, again, you please share one idea yeah. that you plan to use. Okay. 
Uh, Ma'am, first of all, we want to thank for such a wonderful workshop by IIT Bombay on instructional strategies and pedagogical skills. And I want to ask one question. We try to use peer instruction at our classrooms. And we see that some of the, you know, more dominating students, they just press down the other students in some of the discussions. So, I mean, can you suggest some strategy for this problem? Okay. So, uh, I didn't quite fully get the question, but I think what the question is, is that in peer instruction, what happens if uh, the, there, there is one student who is dominating and keeps uh, uh, telling his answer and the other student does not get to uh, discuss. So if that's, is that the question? Okay, so assuming that uh, that is the question, uh, the idea here is that it may happen to begin with in a peer instruction activity, to begin with it may happen that one student may feel that yes, I have the correct answer and this is the correct answer and so on and so forth and may emphasize that their answer is correct. So, but then when they have to start debating and the student has to come up with reasons for why that answer is correct, then it doesn't matter really which student is the loud student or which student is the dominating student. It is the one who has the correct reasoning who will actually prevail in the debating uh, phase or in the peer discussion phase of a peer instruction activity. So uh, as you carry out these activities, the, the students themselves will realize that it may happen that, for example, the student who kept quiet and who, who accepted the answer that was given by the dominant student may, at the, in the summarizing phase, may find that, oh, actually my answer was correct and that guy's was, answer was wrong. And that will be an interesting moment for both the students because the dominating student at that point realizes that there is no point in simply being dominating on, but I need to be more clear about my reasoning of the answer. While the student who was keeping quiet will realize that, okay, it's not necessary that I should only listen to what the other fellow is saying. My answer is also valid. And because if I am clear about the reason for why I have chosen a particular alternative, I should speak up. So as more and more of these activities happen in your classroom, you will find that this balance of dominating versus students who are keeping quiet goes down. One important recommendation for all active learning strategies, especially in peer instruction, is that don't keep marks for right answers in these strategies. If your goal is that students should participate and be engaged and learn and so on. These are not quizzes that are supposed to be used for their final grade. These are in-class activities for them to learn. Uh, B.S. Abdul Rahman, University, Tamil Nadu. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, first of all, I'll thank to uh, all of you. Uh, you are really taking a good session and uh, uh, a, a, a paradigm shift is taking place among the teaching faculties and we are just uh, renovating and going to the next level of teaching. Uh, actually, I have already, uh, uh, I am very much motivated by these classes and uh, I have already implemented and uh, one class, one course I am teaching this time by, uh, by through videos. I am creating the videos and sharing videos to the students and the students are watching the video and their own uh, uh, convenience at home whenever they want time. They can watch twice or thrice also. So by the time they are coming to the class, they are already motivated and they are actually having a lot of ideas, the class in the, in the beginning itself. So I think this is a really good initiative and uh, their feedback is also good. They are really very much uh, motivated with this thing. I am using some bubble thing also for this. Uh, one difficulty I am facing is uh, for some reason if one of the students uh, has not watched the video, the class is becoming literally, um, uh, not very effective for him and he is completely aloof and he is simply sitting and he is not talking much actually. So how to uh, tackle this kind of situation, uh, uh, can you please throw some light on this? Okay, so this is a very common problem with attempting to implement a flipped classroom uh, strategy that if, if one student or some students have not watched the video and come, then they get left behind in the classroom. So in the initial phase, you have to simply ignore these students. Okay. I mean, they have to realize that there is value in coming to class only if they watch the video. So they have to inculcate some discipline in themselves. That is the first thing that we have to get across. For example, this flipped classroom, even though we are using it with technology, it is not a very new idea when you look at it from the perspective of you know, humanities or where they learn about literature and so on. So they have always been doing flipped classroom in the sense that nobody comes to the class and reads the book. So they are expected to read the book before they come and it's only the discussion that happens 
in the classroom so and they develop the discipline of saying that okay this is the verse or this is the uh, portion of the book that i need to read and that's what is going to be discussed in the class so they develop the discipline so that is something that is new to engineering students and we have to encourage them to develop that discipline see the, uh, the point is we we have to be consistent in our response to this um, let me call the use the word uh, slackers so either we have to consistently say that i am going to do a 5 minute summary at the beginning of my class of what was there in the video in which case most of the people are not going to really spend so much time watching the video you have to anticipate that most of them will then simply come to the class and listen to your summary and go on from there but then the video will be useful for those who are sincere or you have to say that look i am going to only target those who are sincere and i am going to work with them and let these slackers you know, uh, be left out for maybe one class and give them some motivation saying that look you have to watch this before you come what you can do as an instructor for example is you can say that come to class 15 minutes early and if the classroom is free you can say that look you can play the video here and watch but the class will start after you have watched the video so a consistent response is what is required to tackle this and do not worry if you are uh, you are not able to include all the students in the activity they will eventually get the hang of it uh, what i am saying is that uh, uh, this creating these videos are taking a lot of time like uh, i have felt personally that Uh, for creating one hour video is taking at least 4 hour time That's to me right. so uh, now my my uh, my uh, something uh, my uh, that uh, 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 suspicion is can i use the same video in the next class when i teach this class after one year can i use the same video because in that case what will happen the, it will be a monotonous class like now people know already that this is the video he is going to use the class so uh, there will be nothing much new in the class in the next year So, what is uh, your okay, idea so about take, this? I'll take uh, a question in two parts. Uh, There are two parts to your question. One is, can you use the same video next year? Definitely, very much so. And not just you can use your own video in the following year's class, but if you find videos on the same subject that somebody else has made and posted in uh, as uh, Creative Commons or in open sources, definitely you can use it. Now, regarding the second part of it about the monotony, uh, that really depends on what you do in class. because the when we push the information transmission part out of the class what's being emphasized in class are activities and discussions and problem solving and high order thinking and so on there you have a lot of flexibility what is not recommended is when they come to class then repeating the video or explaining the same thing that is in the video that's not a good idea but if you use the in class time for problem solving or such applications then you can change it as per the audience you can change it year after year and the monotony aspect won't be there yeah, one more one there's one more response yeah yeah so uh, regarding uh, usage of videos of others uh, what we recommend to you is that all the qtriply videos that you have created uh, should be uploaded in youtube that is why the assignment specifically asked you to upload the videos in youtube so we will share it among the entire qtriply community so it will be creative commons share alike license and so in fact if you want to watch what another participant within the same domain has created for the similar topic all you have to do is go to the appropriate link which will come up in the wiki and if both you and the other participant populate then you can watch the other participants video so there is both give and take uh within the qtriply wiki idea so as a participant you have to upload your resource you have to share the resource and other participants will watch it and will give feedback tyagaraj college hello hello please good afternoon sir sir my question is uh, we used the new pedagogical approach for uh, conducting theory and uh, project theory courses and uh, project Uh, the curricular component also involves the practical courses shall we use the same uh, cognitive aspects of the bloom's taxonomy for practical courses or we get to consider the psychomotor aspects of the bloom's taxonomy okay so uh, i would say yes and yes in the sense it really depends 
uh, on what exactly you want students to learn in the labs. The cognitive aspect will definitely be present in labs even when there is a psychomotor aspect present. So, most likely what is going to happen in the labs is that there will be some psychomotor aspect present as part of your objectives. For example, you might want students to be able to connect a circuit together or you might want them to take a machine apart and put it back together, but mostly it is the cognitive aspect which is dominant here. And you can take the taking apart and breaking component as within the analyze level or the apply level, usually it comes under the analyze or even the create level when they are designing something. Uh, in fact, this is something we did not talk about much, so thanks for bringing it up that using Bloom's taxonomy and assessment questions the way we discussed should also be thought of in the similar way for lab courses and practical courses. In fact, there is a lot more application there and do think of getting students to do applying and analyzing and creating in the lab courses. Hello, this is again from Tiara Chakraji Engineering. Yeah. So, uh, having come to this digital taxonomy, uh, is it advisable to have this digital taxonomy as one of the course in, the, in our curriculum? the first year itself. Uh, I am not sure exactly what you mean as having the taxonomy as a course, but again what you what the taxonomy helps you do. So, the taxonomy you can think of as a tool for you as a teacher. If you want to use technology to be used by your students, the taxonomy is like a lookup table that tells you that for such and such objective use such and such tool in such and such manner use the taxonomy in in that uh, with that goal when you are designing your courses. TKM College of Engineering Kollam. I have already implemented the TPS activity in my class and found it to be very effective. Right now I am going with uh, digital system design with VHTL. My plan is to implement uh, the flipped classroom strategy for explaining the constructs and syntax of VHTL language. And then after in the class, I will, I will be using this uh, same for writing the course, exercise and programming so that the students will feel more comfortable and uh, easier to do the programs. Okay, that's very good to hear. Uh, I would also uh, request you to share your experience of implementing TPS either in a you know written form like what you just said that I have implemented it in my class this is what the students did and this is what I found as maybe a short half a page write up on the wiki or if you feel uh, encouraged since you have already created a flipped classroom you can also create a short video of uh, what your experience of using uh, TPS in your classroom and share it with the other participants. It is very important for us to actually encourage each other only by looking at you having implemented a technique in your classroom will other participants feel that feel the motivation or the uh, enthusiasm to go ahead and try it in their classes. So, this sort of sharing of success stories is very important. So, please go ahead and share it with us. Okay, uh, so uh, TKM college uh, hope you understand uh, hope you have seen the T4E advertisement. So, it is happening at Amritapuri Kollam and you are the closest college to that particular venue. So, I hope uh, we will have good participation from, yeah, good participation from the TKM college uh, faculty at T4E 2000. We will all be there. So, hope to meet you. Do come and talk to us and tell us about your experiences in person in December. Aditya Institute, please go ahead. Sir, good afternoon. Yes, please go ahead. And uh, I would like to ask one question as far as this particular software applications that has been told by you all these uh, days and uh, you just tell me the probable implementation or uh, getting effective teaching in a classroom for a particular class and injecting into the minds of the students, injecting the concept in the minds of the students and uh, the rate of possibilities and you just can you please tell me the schedule and the tenure uh, that is to be tried for that thank you sir yeah yeah that's awesome. okay so uh, i'm not sure exactly what you're asking but i'll make a couple of comments first of all we never inject anything into students minds 
And one thing that we have emphasized a lot over these three days is that learning is much more than information transfer. It is not that we have information which sits in our hands and we just give it or pour it into students. That model does not work. All the strategies and the technologies which support it help the students to learn on their own, learn better and deeper. Uh, and all we are doing is creating the environment for it. All that the technology is helping us is supporting us uh, into creation of an environment where students learn. Yeah, and uh, let me also add that there is no single answer to this question of give me a schedule which will make my classroom very effective. So it all depends upon your personality as the instructor, what is your rapport with your students. And so basically nobody else can do your work. You are the one who is there in front of the students. You have to apply your creativity to come up with strategies that work for you. What we can do is we can provide you exposure to so many strategies. We can help you learn these strategies as learners. We can help you design strategies that you will use as teachers for your students and so on. But finally, at the end of the day, the schedule that you are asking for, which will uh, make your students blossom into uh, experts in that particular topic is something that you have to come up with. We cannot give it to you. In fact, nobody can give it to you. Don Bosco, College of Engineering. Question uh, regarding a flipped classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, in case of flipped classroom, uh, the learning takes place outside the class. For example, we give a video and students watch it. And the assimilation takes place in class. For example, we can have a TPS session. Uh, but now students have different cognitive levels for some students may be intelligent so they can learn uh, from the out of class video whereas other students which have lower cognitive levels they may not be able to learn from the out of class video. Uh, so how can we handle that and then also uh, students have different uh, learning styles some students learn from uh, theories uh, some students learn by observing uh, other people uh, other students learn better by doing out, working out problems. So how can we handle different learning styles also in this setup? Okay, so the first question is what about students who are uh, not able to cope up with the material in a flipped classroom video, whereas others who are able to uh, understand from the video itself and come to class. So that's why, so the, the flipped classroom video is not simply a capture of your lecture. See, that is the thing that we have to keep in mind while creating these flipped classroom videos. It's not that we are lecturing or we are using a tab and, and simply explaining all the complex concepts in the um, topic. So the flipped classroom is basically simply outsourcing the lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So the recall and understand levels are what we are outsourcing to the flipped part of the model. The actual application, the problem solving, all of that is going to happen in the classroom. So what happens is that even if the student has not entirely followed what was there in the video, what you could do is you could have a small PI question at the start of your uh, session. Before you go on to problem solving, you ask a PI question at the understand level, which will ensure that students who have not entirely understood, who have some difficulty, they will be able to discuss with their peers and understand that part before they move on to the problem solving in the TPS part. So that is something that you could do. At the same time, the out of class component does not help students learn all the things that you want them to do. So right at the beginning, you made a statement that the out of class component is where students learn and in class component is where they assimilate. I, I think you should think of it in a slightly different way that the out of class component is where they learn certain types and certain levels of learning and the in-class component is where they learn different types of uh, and different levels. So everybody needs to learn problem solving and everybody also needs to be able to understand and define the concepts and these are done in different parts. Okay, coming to the second part of the question of students having different learning styles and how do we cater to these different learning styles. See, it's one thing is that we can only make all the, th all the various material for different styles available. That is one thing we can do. Another is we can, um, in some cases, even though the student may have one style, the, the nature of the topic may require that the student learn it in a different style. So in which case the student has to also put in some effort. So the main thing here is we have to trust the students that they will select the material and they will spend as much time on the material as required as is appropriate for their style. 
for example if somebody is is an audio learner they may just listen to your video and they may understand the whole thing on the other hand somebody else who is a text based learner may not find your video very useful but may find the transcript more useful and may be able to remember the transcript word for word so we have to trust that you know we have to just make all of these things available and trust that they will choose one that works for them after all they are the ones who are invested in learning the topic so now uh, there are no no further hand raises 